Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knappick. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. Okay, today's episode, Videodrome. Directed by David Cronenberg, 1983. He's had a long career, David Cronenberg. Cronenberg is a really, really fascinating director. And and he's able to come up with stuff that I don't think anybody else would dare try to come up with. The only other director I can think of is is, is David Lynch, who right. com- who would, would come up with this really bizarre stuff and just go with it. More on the sci-fi bent. Like, yeah. And, and it, both of them initially, it was kind of this a weird- fan, This fantastical, yeah. you know, everyday man thrust into these situations. And they have a great imagination. The difference for me is, and, and I love Lynch's stuff, but the difference for me is that David Lynch sometimes puts in stuff that's just weird for the sake of being weird. With Cronenberg, he builds this reality that you think that's not even possible, that you, you couldn't even think of this sort of thing. And, right. he, and he does it with such reckless abandon. I mean, they both almost came up similar at times, and, and they yes. had similar beginnings. Like, they both... Did short films right. and, you know, that were artsy, but really interesting. strange. Very and, intellectual. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's interesting for me about Cronenberg is that he, for a long time, certainly in the early days, he was, he was funded by uh, the Canadian Film Development Corporation. Yeah. But once he premiered Shivers, or They Came From Within, right. the critics went bananas. And basically, one of the critics was saying, you know, you should go see this uh, this David Cronenberg movie. It, it's it's horrific. It's disgusting. But you paid for it. <laughs> and, and and according to Cronenberg, it was actually responsible for um, his, the reaction to this was actually responsible for. And that article that this one critic wrote was responsible for him getting kicked out of his apartment. There was some sort of morality clause. That got, and the guy <laughs> kicked him out of his apartment because they were so horrified by the, the graphic sexuality yeah. and the graphic blood, et cetera, et cetera. But... Uh, so yeah. let's go through his movies. And, and again, there's lots of movies. We can't talk about every single one. No, no, no. But, of course not. Uh, again, he started out doing short films, but his first feature was independent, was Shivers. Right. Or They Came From Within. Yeah. And right after that was Rabbit in 1977. With a notorious Marilyn Chambers. Marilyn Chambers, who was a early porn star. Right. And very similar films in a way, right? They're almost like Shivers had that little slug, whatever that Parasite. was. Parasite. Parasite. Yeah. I have this image of Joe Silver with a pair of pliers trying to pull one of those parasites off his face. <laughs> and some weird, like, pedophilia going on in that movie. Very strange. You know, you, you mentioned some of these, you know, really over-the-top type taboos. But what's fascinating to me about Cronenberg is that he just does not flinch. Right. He does not turn away. I remember reading something about... Um, uh, Kurosawa is saying an artist must not look away. And Cronenberg, without a doubt, does not look away. In fact, he just goes, you know, full speed ahead, damn yeah. the torpedoes. Okay, so right after Rabid, uh, he did The Brood. One and, of my all-time favorite Cronenbergs. Which I think is one of his best films. It's amazing. Basically, it's an <laughs> allegory on divorce, basically. Yeah, because um, he was going through divorce at the time. And uh, that, that was his Kramer versus Kramer. Oliver Reed in that yeah. movie. Samantha Egger, terrific. And then right after that, he did a Scanners. Scanners. Uh, in 81. First time I ever saw a head explode. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never seen a head explode before. That's... A really interesting movie. I would say that it has one of the bleakest, if not the bleakest soundtracks I've ever heard. It's yeah. just, just it's just bleak from beginning to end. It's a great soundtrack. Uh, and also, again, he's another guy in, in the, the 70s going into the 80s who did a lot of work with uh, prosthetics and makeup and special effects that were not computer generated. Exactly. These are all real effects. And that's the, the really cool thing about we're, we're doing video drum today and, and there are effects in here done by Rick Baker, yeah. which are just unbelievable. And and when you look at it now, you may go, oh, geez, it may not look as good as it could. But we're talking about state-of-the-art stuff. Right. And it and, and wasn't CGI and a lot of this stuff had to be you know done with prosthetics and, and yeah. Yeah. Phone rubber and other stuff, but it, practical. It, it, it practical. It really looks beautiful. Yeah. Oh, if if you can call some of the things right. beautiful. So right after scanners in 1983, Videodrome, obviously, but then in the same year, funny enough, the Dead Zone. 
which is one of the best Stephen King I would, adaptations. It's, it's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. I think it's it's fantastic. Christopher Walken's great. But this just shows you also something else about um, Cronenberg. He doesn't have to only have his own material. He can take someone else's material and really make it his own. Well, that's the first time we see that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah. That's, that was really a, a, like a revelation for me yeah. because – I thought, you know, this guy is just his own animal. He's the auteur, and he he comes up with a, a notion, and that's that. And I and I think it's a great screenplay. Right. Uh, so the thing with the Dead Zone is, I think that's his first crossover into Hollywood. Right. Like Videodrome was the last kind of Canadian independent exactly. movie. He did get a bigger budget for yeah. that, but you can see the budget difference. Yeah. You know, certainly from Shivers and <laughs> Rabbit. And so. Now he's big in Hollywood, and the next film that comes out is The Fly right. with Jeff Goldblum. Well, this is, once again, this is amazing because he's a gun for hire in this case. It's not a Cronenberg, you know, generated project. And he he does a, an amazing job with this. It's a remake, but he wrote the story, I think, or the screenplay. He wrote part of the screenplay, not the entire screenplay. That was not his screenplay to start with. In fact, he said that uh, when it came to uh, doing The Fly, a lot of people thought all the kind of gross-out stuff and, yeah. and these, these kind of disgusting images, that was all Cronenberg. He said, no, 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 no. I wrote the relationship stuff. It felt like a Cronenberg script to Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it had a lot of those elements in it. Right. But I mean, it just as far as a project self-generated, didn't just come directly out of his head, that right. sort of thing. Uh, so right after uh, The Fly, we have uh, Dead Ringers with- An- Another one of my all-time Jeremy favorites. Irons. In a dual role incredible yeah. performance. Yeah. He's talking to himself walking down a hallway. Yeah. And the conversation is seamless. It's well, that amazing. was, they used uh, motion uh, control with right. the camera. Right. So that's a beautiful movie. I just have to say it's very poignant and sad. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, Existence, A History of Violence. Naked Lunch. And Crash. Crash. Uh, Crash is a fantastic movie. Now, it's certainly not for everybody. And even the French, they gave him the special jury prize for right. Crash for audacity. And this had uh, James Spader. And Holly Hunter. And Rosanna Arquette. The thing is about Holly Hunter is you would never in a million years expect her in a movie like that. But she pushed to be in that movie. So it's pretty interesting. Well, she wanted to really she, push herself out of that type she, that she was in. She's pretty racy in the piano also. I'll oh, say. that's true. <laughs> but uh, Crash from a J.G. Ballard novel, right? right? And one of his latest ones I really liked was uh, Eastern Promises. I didn't see it. Viggo Mortensen is in that. He was uh, in History of Violence, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Also, Cronenberg, as an actor, was pretty notable in a couple of different roles. One one really comes to mind is in the movie uh, written and directed by Clive Barker, Nightbreed. And he plays this serial killer, Dr. Philip K. Decker. And uh, he has this this weird kind of almost looks like a scarecrow mask with a zipper face and buttons for eyes. It's really creepy. He's really creepy and really good in it. He stars in that? Yeah, he's one of the stars. And he also uh, was the gynecologist in The Fly. And he was uh, uh, an obstetrician in Dead Ringers. Then we have the cinematographer in this, Mark Irwin. He was with Cronenberg pretty much... From the almost beginning, the first thing he did was a, a racing movie that Cronenberg did. We didn't discuss before, but Fast Company. And everything from there he did. Scanners, Videodrome, The Dead Zone, The Fly. He just kept going with him. So that's and his man. Very distinguishing look to the film. Absolutely. And you think of Cronenberg when you see those looks, but obviously it's Mark Irwin doing the lighting. Absolutely. Almost like a clinicalness to them. Yep. Not very warm looking. No. You know, very cold feeling films, uh, but beautiful. But another factor involved with the look of the film is really, I would say his creative partner is Carol Spear, who was his production designer. And, and, and the look that you see in each of these films, like you said, the coldness and yeah. strange little eccentricities that different characters have, especially in the, we see in, in Videodrome, that's all Carol Spear. She really captures the, these things. Like uh, I mean, in Videodrome, it really comes to the forefront. Oh, it's fantastic. Amazing yeah. look. And, and she, and, but The Brood has that Absolutely. She it. did yeah. that as well. I mean, she really was- It's funny because I always thought they all kind of look Canadian, in my mind, this Canadian feel to it, all shot around Toronto, right. I guess. Sure. But obviously it has to do with, with the design. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and she really was, like I said, a real integral partner to, to his vision, to what yeah. it was really going to look like. So she was it for him. A great part of this movie in a lot of Cronenberg films is the music, Howard Shore, who it's, has it's, a it's, very, very long career. He's he's like uh, the John Williams yeah. for Cronenberg. It's interesting because you and I used to be big fans 
of Howard Shore because of Cronenberg. Absolutely. But he's almost got a second career after that because he became so famous in Hollywood. Incredible. And he, he did After Hours, Silence of the Lamb. He did big, John. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the diversity. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, which he won Academy Awards for, and, and just incredible stuff. But he has a, a real quality when he's working for, or I should say with Cronenberg, yeah. that, that takes you right in there. But very early, uh, to me, if I can remember correctly, very early kind of electronic sound. Yes, and, absolutely. And this is 70s, Keyboard stuff, 80s. Yeah. And I remember you giving me some tapes of his soundtrack. Tapes. And That's we, way back, we John. were like really <laughs> tapes, cassettes. Yep. We were very big fans of Howard Shore before he made it big. Absolutely. Well, I mean, he was known through Cronenberg pretty much. Yeah. I mean, um, his soundtrack for The Fly is fantastic. Yeah. One of my top five soundtracks is Dead Ringers. It's just a beautiful, beautiful soundtrack. There you go. We're in agreement. And then, of course, we cannot forget the special effects on this. Rick Baker. Rick Baker. Uh, unbelievable. He, he just You know, he's, he, his, one of his early movies was the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. He did the makeup. He did the makeup for that. That's right. For her. Yeah, yeah. For, 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 for her Tyson. aging, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, he, he's, he's been around a long, long time. In fact, when he was really young, he had all these different masks and whatnot. And when George Lucas was doing Star Wars, he basically went down Baker's basement and said, okay, I'll, I'll take that one, and I'll take that one, I'll take that one. And for the cantina scene, yeah. those masks, a lot of the masks at least, were masks that, uh, that Rick Baker created. So, I mean, a career guy who was an innovator – you know, like 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 almost no one else, like a Dick Smith, yeah, um, just could do makeup effects and other types of effects uh, that just and, creates a whole reality that you couldn't even possibly get. And worked with a lot of directors. I mean, like yeah. the, uh, John Landis, American Werewolf. I right. think he won an Oscar for that. Right, right, uh, right. American Werewolf in London. It's unbelievable. Um, even like Ed Wood, he does the makeup. Uh -huh. uh, so not even only special effects. He's doing makeup. Right. Effects. Well, I, 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 cause that's what he said. He's like Dick Smith plus because yeah. he does these effects and he does the makeup. So it's he's a he's a wizard. Yeah, yeah, without question. And then we got the one, the only, starring James Woods. <laughs> How is that guy a star? I mean, he's a great actor, but I was watching him in this movie, and you look at him going, he's the oddest looking guy. He's a weird looking guy <laughs> with, with kind of pockmarked skin and stuff. Yeah, but he has a presence. Oh, he yeah, he really has a presence. He goes way back. He was in the way we were. Yes. And uh, then he was in Night Moves with Gene Hackman, the Arthur Penn movie. He was in the Choir Boys. Must, right. must have been a Joseph Wambach kind of thing. Because he later, the most memorable thing for me is yeah. I saw the commercial for The Onion Field. And it scared the shit out of me. He plays one of the criminals in yeah. that movie. He's so scary. He's really scary. Yeah. And I think I, that kind of I was afraid when I saw him in the, uh, the, the trailer on television. I thought, oh my God, well, who is this guy? But he was also had a really big role in Holocaust, that, yes. that television movie Absolutely. with, uh, with Meryl, Meryl Streep. Streep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite Oliver Stone movies uh, and, and a favorite uh, James Wood movies, Salvador. Salvador put him over the top. Well, that it was, was a, a really, movie. really, it's, it is a terrific film and it's yeah. really well written and directed and Woods is terrific in it. Bestseller, Larry Cohen. <laughs> a Larry Cohen script with Brian Dennehy. I love I love that movie. He, he plays a hitman. He wants Dennehy to write uh, his life story. Right. That's what it's about. But, but he's... He's perfect in that. He's been in tons of movies, but who can forget him in Casino? <laughs> As the uh, sleazy boyfriend. And of course, his co-star in this, Deborah Harry yeah. from Blondie, Blondie. fame. Uh, she does a really great job in this. She's, uh, yeah. You know, Cronenberg uh, is, is able to pull performances out of people that you wouldn't really expect him to be able to pull performances out of. Uh, she was also in uh, uh, a movie called Union City that right. was way, way back. That's like an early, early uh, independent film. There are a bunch of other actors in this. Sonia Smits. As uh, Bianca Oblivion. Peter Dvorsky. That's Harlan. Uh, Jack Creeley. <laughs> Jack Creeley is Brian Oblivion. Love this character. Julie Kaner. Is Bridie. And Lynn Gorman. Lynn Gorman is Masha. What's interesting about these Actors, actually, everybody in the movie, but these other actors, they're basically a lot of television stuff. Yeah. And this is really the only film. Are they primarily Canadian actors? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's interesting to me is Cronenberg is, is looked at as this hard director and a lot of blood and a lot of effects and a lot of guts. And I, I think people don't take the time to look at him as a, as a writer and as a really good director. Yeah. And he got performances out of these guys that are just terrific. Which adds to the story because it, it's kind of this ensemble cast 
and you may not be familiar with them, but they are good actors, like you say. Right. And it just it just gives this flavor to the film. Absolutely. This oddness. Yeah. Oddness to it. And I'll just add one more. Leslie Carlson as, as Barry, Barry Convex. Convex. Yeah, another great face. He goes back to uh, to uh, to Black Christmas, the Bob Clark horror film. Oh, yeah. He's, he's the one who did um, A Christmas Story later okay. on, which is right, kind, right. Of, kind of weird. Leslie or Les Carlson was actually in The Christmas Story. Uh, here's some trivia. Can you tell me who he was? I cannot. He was the tree salesman. <laughs> okay. That, that, that Ralphie's father was bargaining with. <laughs> Thank you for that. There you go. And I just want to make a point about Howard Shore because the movie doesn't even start yet. You have the Universal logo come up. Yeah. And you already hear these two really bleak sounding notes. And that's Howard Shore basically letting you know, okay, this is where we're going. Yeah. Strap yourself in because (laughs) this isn't going to be pretty. Very ominous sounds. Absolutely. And the movie hasn't even started yet. And we see this uh, kind of a station ID on this television set for uh, Civic TV, I, channel, I love the, I channel love the, 83. I love the logo. This, this, this kind of middle-aged, chubby guy lying in bed uh, with the television set actually in bed. And he's got his little teddy bear next to him. Civic TV, the one you take to bed with you. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> Back before cable, there was something called UHF, which were these stations, which were all independent, right? right? Most right. of them local. Right. And they were at the far end of the dial. Yeah, and they were kind of cheesy. I mean, yeah. sometimes you get bored with network television. Some were religion, some right. were this or that. So it's funny that we see this commercial or this this identification on the TV, right. and then you hear this voice. It's a girl's face talking directly at you from right. the television set. And it's his, uh, his quote unquote, Girl Friday. His Girl Bridie. Friday, Bridie. It's kind of like a crude video alarm clock. Right. Which which is interesting because this guy, it, we, we come to learn, is he, he runs this television station and his whole world is really about television. So him getting woken up with this this television alarm clock thing, right. you know, message from his, uh, his girl Friday, his secretary, is, is, is just fits right in with this character. So he wakes up and it's James Woods. Max Wren is the character. And he lives in this kind of very 70s, slick looking apartment. Very he's slick. Eating cold pizza for breakfast. Yeah, you know, it really gives him a, gives you a setup of who this guy is. He's he's yeah. kind of sleazy, he's kind of creepy, and and he's he's making coffee and it's kind of an old filthy coffee pot. Yeah, yeah. And then he he's eating pizza and and he's he's dunking it in the coffee while he's looking at Pornographic images, right? Uh, stills from stills. this movie that somebody is looking to hawk to his television station. Yeah, and well, what, what's funny is the whole setup kind of is reminiscent of kind of like an old private eye in a way. You got the yes. Gal Friday, yes, the bachelor That's a good point, pad. John. Yeah, so we've learned from this voice that he's got this meeting, important meeting from his Gal Friday. You cut to this low rent neighborhood. He's walking on the street and he's entering the, I love this, the classic hotel. <laughs> and believe me, there's nothing classic no. about it. No, It's like a dumpy hotel. Some guy's down the hall screaming to get in from his girlfriend. Right, right. Yeah. And, and he knocks on the door and of course, you see him steal some matches from the cleaning lady, and this Japanese man <laughs> opens the door, and it's so cheap he pulls the lock off. Right. So we learn from this uh, that this is a salesman, this Japanese guy, and right. he's selling some show called Samurai, Samurai Dreams. Samurai Dreams, which is a softcore pornography. Yeah. That you you might catch in the early days of cable. And it's the same principle, though, because, right. you know, this this is a it's called civic TV. Again, nothing civic about it because he's just showing anything he can just to get viewers. Right. Uh, that's how they make their money. That's right. So this guy's trying to peddle, say, soft core porn. Right. It almost reminded me of that Oshima movie. What was that called? Uh, Realm of the Senses? Yes. Yeah, me too. It was very Realm of the Senses. Yeah. 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 So he's, he takes some cassettes. In fact, in fact, they have 13. He goes, oh, just show me the last one. And they go, but Max, you're going to miss the whole point and, and the whole setup of the character. He says, my, my, my viewers are not even going to see the first. They're going to go right 12. to the end. They're just going to see Because that's where the stuff happens. That's right. So, and But there's a nice that. cut where you see it on the screen and it cuts to the conference room. So Max is in the conference room now with his, his two partners. And they're talking about, you know, screening, they're screening Samurai Dreams. And they're going, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you think of this? And one of his partners says, Oriental sex is a natural. 
Right, but the other guy is like, eh, it's not tacky enough. It's too much class. Too bad, for, bad for sex. So they're looking for something sleazier. You know, the, clearly they're going for the low-hanging fruit. They need viewers. And Max goes, we need something to break through. Something tough. Yeah. And then we cut out on the roof, and it's this huge satellite dish, and it's turning, 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 trying to find a signal. And, and the camera follows this cable down the wall into this little basement lab. Paint peeling all over the place. It's just a, a dirty, dank, you but know. Like an electronics lab. Uh, and there with we those need- those metal shelves that have yeah. electronic uh, oh, Gear everywhere. Yeah. yeah, just like- Boxes of stuff. And we meet the uh, the tech. He, he looks kind of like um, Harold Ramis. Right, if he does. He was, yeah. if, he was, if he was dressed in L.L. Bean or something. You know? <laughs> Harlan is his name. So he's tinkering with the equipment, and Max walks in. And he's like, what do you got for me, basically? And Harlan is kind of a little excited. He's, he's found something. Now, just a, just a quick aside. This is only about seven minutes into the movie. Yeah. I mean, this thing is really going and setting up and doing all these different things. Cronenberg is really moving things along. It's yeah. a very tight script. So Harlan is telling uh, Max that he's picked up a signal, and it's only 53 seconds. He doesn't know where it's from, really. He thinks um, he, he thinks it might be from Malaysia. He thinks. Some sort of a time delay or something. And he, he shows Max, and it's this weird looking set. It looks like a wet basement. But like red clay. Yeah, it has red clay walls. Yeah. And it looks like people have been trying to climb out of there or something because you see handprints on it. And and the basement's completely wet. There's about, what, a foot of water in it? And there are two these two hooded guys with these black aprons on and black hoods and, and rubber gloves. And they're taking this female victim to the wall to shackle her up and, you know, presumably whip and torture her. And it's a very strange image. It's very raw looking, first of all. And it's almost like you're seeing something you shouldn't be seeing. And Max is right away, you could see he's like he's drawn fascinated. to this thing. Yeah. He's fascinated. It's like, what he is has, this? He has a grimace of horror because he can't believe quite what he's looking at. But yeah. at, at the same time, it's simultaneous. He's really fascinated by this. Of course. And, and, and you are too as a viewer because you're like, what is this? This is so timely. Yeah. Yet it was made in 83. Yeah. But it's so timely because- if you were to just troll around the internet, you could find anything you want. Right. I mean, literally anything you want. And I don't even want to think about what the dark web is. I mean, I, well, don't, I don't even know what that is. That's what really. this is more akin to. Yeah. It's definitely like the dark web. Yeah, absolutely. So Max is really intrigued and he wants Harlan to search for more. He says, J just find me more. So just a few seconds. Uh, yeah. Just 53 seconds? You yeah, it just right. cuts out. And, yeah. and, and it just goes. Yep. And it goes. That's the end of it. Wait, what was that again? The <laughs> How do you spell that? I don't know if I can spell it. I, I can probably do it again. No, though. you don't have to. So, it's pretty so, good. So it goes, and it just blacks out. And Max goes, that's it? And Harlan says, that's it. Grotesque as promised, Patron. He keeps calling him Patron. Patron. That's his, his name for him. Yes. He has this little twinkle in his eye. You know, you, you want grotesque? I give you grotesque. And he's always a step ahead of, of, of Max. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the next scene, we see we see Max on this, this local talk show. It's called The Renna King Show. Right. And on the show is this radio host, this really sexy woman named Nikki. Nikki Brand, played by Blondie. Played or, by? Or, or, or Deborah Harry. And this other character, Brian Oblivion. Uh, and Brian Oblivion is kind of like this uh, Marshall McLuhan type character. Yeah. Like in the 60s and 70s, Marshall McLuhan was like this philosopher, commentator who- He studied the media. He had this whole, the medium is is the message, right. if you've ever heard that. Absolutely. That's from Marsha McLuhan. Yep. And this is what this guy is based on. Absolutely. And and on the show, she is so sexy, Nikki Brand, that actually Max- Asks her out asks, on air. On air, which is kind of funny. <laughs> but, I'd really like to ask you at the dinner. So we get back to the lab. So Harlan comes through and he, and he pulls up uh, some more of this, uh, this torture and murder broadcast stuff. Yeah. And this time, the, the victim is this black guy. He's, and he's uh, just hanging by chains. Yeah. And he's being whipped and electronically shocked. By the two same henchmen. Right. In With leather the, aprons. And hoods. And yep. we have no idea what they look like, but in the same Videodrome yeah. room, whatever this is, this basement room. And, and Max goes, uh, when does the plot start to, to unravel here? Who is this black guy? Is he a political prisoner? And Harlan says, there is no plot. It just goes on like that <laughs> for an hour. Torture, murder, mutilation. A real sicko for perverts only. And Max says, you know, this is brilliant. We never leave that room. 
absolutely brilliant. I mean, look, there's, there's almost no production cost, and you can't take your eyes off it. The funny thing is, Max cannot get it out of his head that this isn't produced some way, like fake. Right. So he's like, who are the actors? As you said, what's the plot? He thinks it's all put on. Right. He cannot accept the fact that it's real. Wouldn't that be the logical thing to think? Could you actually think that you could have this sort of video running? Well, right. Now we're so used to quote unquote reality TV, which we know is not real. Right. But that didn't exist then. So he's his mind is still in the this place where it's it's some great kind of production. You know, because what the perfect idea, like no production value, just pure violence. What's interesting to me when I look at this, I think about back in the day when they had something called Snuff. Right. Remember the whole controversy well, about Snuff? The, yeah, in the, the 70s. movie that was made. And supposedly you actually see real murder take right. place on the screen. Which was always kind of the urban lore right. that these snuff films were out there and they would put them on Times Square. They were all just kind of exploitation films. They may have been snuff films, but they never won. Well, Paul Schrader theater. takes that whole idea yes. and goes with it in, in the movie Hardcore with uh, right. George C. Scott. Sure. So the idea here is this is some kind of a snuff thing happening. Right. But Max, again, at this point, he still doesn't can't get his mind around that. And then, funny enough... I love the, the the tag on the scene is Holland's like, he explains the signal's not coming from Malaysia, but Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> not so exotic anymore. I always thought it was that like a, a reference to George Romero or something. I, 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 that's a good point. I, I, I didn't think of that. But but that again, that further intrigues Max, funny enough. Like, what? But Woods is the perfect guy for the job. He slips so easily into character. Like You know, this guy has no moral scruples at all. Whatever's good for business. Right, exactly. It's good for Max. And and you can see in this scene, like, the hook is is set. In comes Nikki Brand, who is a, a call and talk show host for a show called Emotional Rescue. And uh, I don't know, Judd, do you think Mick and Keith uh, got any royalties for that? <laughs> well, it's funny. I looked it up because okay. I was like, what came first? And actually, the album came first. So he takes her out, and, and we end up at his apartment. I love how uh, Max's whole apartment is all about television. Yeah. He's got, he's got boxes of videotapes. The television is always on. Well, it's his life. Right, exactly. So Nikki is looking through a bunch of videotapes, and she says, you got any porn? And Max looks at her like, you serious? And she goes, yeah. yeah, sure, why not? It gets me in the mood. Sure. So we she, go, she's okay. ready to go this I was going to say, she's ready to go. That's, they barely just got in the yeah. apartment. So she goes, what's this? And uh, it's Videodrome. And he goes, oh, well, that's just, you know, torture, murder. She goes, oh. He's like kind my- of, it's funny. He's kind of dismissive in a way, almost like. Yeah, he, just, he doesn't even realize what it is in a sense. He's yeah, like, just yeah, torture, she, murder. Yeah. And, but she goes, oh. <laughs> Sounds good to me. I, I, I'd i like to see that. <laughs> I like how they sit on the couch all kind of cozy up like they're watching, I don't know, uh, some, some old uh, Betty Davis movie or something. And she asks him, does he have a Swiss army knife? <laughs> I found that funny. Like, Swiss army knife? We find some interesting things out about Nikki Brand. Yeah. That she's really into this... S&M self-mutilation or minor yeah. mutilation of herself and getting cut. and, and Well, and she asks him to cut her on the shoulder. Right. And we see this like about four yeah. previous cuts. And they're not healed. They're no, it's pretty recent. Scabbed. Right. He's so, a little weirded out by it. Yeah. But at the same time, kind of intrigued. I know. I thought it was funny, though, that your initial impression of Max is he's always looking for the next crazy thing. But- Here's someone that's really kind of crazy, and but he's, but he's a little thrown off. You got a point, John, because he is more the voyeur. Yeah, you know, he's right. not necessarily the guy who dives in. He's the voyeur. That's and a really that's, good point, and Rob. that's the way he is. But he seems to get pulled in bit by bit for certain things that are titillating, yeah. sexual or otherwise. And she is looking at this show. But she's wondering, how can she get on? She wants to be a contestant. Yeah. She's like, how do you, get, how do you become a contestant you know, this, on this, this show? This is not exactly the price is right. I, mean, I don't think Johnny Olsen calls you down and said, you're the next on Videodrome. But like, I'm thinking, who would look at that and go, how can I get on? <laughs> but that's what makes her character interesting. And that's what pulls Max in a little bit further into this other kind of netherworld. 
So we cut to them, and they're suddenly naked on the floor in front of the TV. Right. Max is is, is going along with, with Nikki's uh, preference, and he has a, a hat pin is what it is, one of those long yeah. pins with a yeah, yeah. little, little uh, pearl kind of ball at the back. And he's just playing around by poking her in the skin and then puts it in her ear and starts to draw blood. Well, he goes right through her earlobe because right. on the other side he's holding a cork. Right, which is basically how you pierce an ear if, yeah. you, if you're going to do it the but homemade way. Without any ice or anything. No. So she's into it and she's really enjoying it. Well, you could see her face becomes, she kind of gets very kind of excited as yeah. that happens. I mean, it does have an effect on her. Absolutely. She's enjoying herself. And so is Max at this point. In fact, he puts it through her ear at one point and then whatever blood's left over on it, he just licks the blood off like some sort of savage. Yeah. So Max is starting to go a little bit further than being just a voyeur. He's starting to experience stuff right. in a certain way that he is not before. And then the camera pulls back and we're suddenly on the set of video drum. But this sort of si- stylized set because it's yeah. a combination. You know it's what like I'm the mind? black rubber floor suddenly. It kind of and... reminded me of a combination of the clean wood Japanese set for Samurai yeah, yeah. Dreams right. mixed with the really creepy, dark basement and clay wall yeah. of the video drum set. So, and, and they're so what just, are we seeing here? You know? They're just on the set, laying down in the same position, basically. And then we cut back to the screen again. So we go into the set and then we come back out. When we cut out of the screen, it's Max kind of shaking his head going, what the hell was that? Yeah. You like, know, is it a hallucination or Exactly. What? So clearly something's going on here. And we cut to uh, back to the TV office. Civic TV. I love it's Civic TV as if this is for the general public. Yeah, Max. It's their civic duty. <laughs> <laughs> and here we meet Bridey, Gal Friday, in the right. flesh this time. Uh, he comes in and she hands him her coffee. And he's rushing into a meeting. I love this. He's walking down the hall and there's some young blonde intern. Smacks her on the butt. No, he pinches her. Oh, that's right. And the girl turns to him and smiles as if like this is a game they play every day. Sure. And I'm like, times have changed. So then he he goes into this room because there's somebody waiting for him that Bridie tells him. And um, it's uh, this client of his, Masha. Yeah. And she- um, I love Masha. I love the actress, Lynn Gorman, because she's she's really authentic. You yeah. totally believe she's this character. She has this really uh, raspy, kind of gravelly, yeah. uh, uh, old broad type. Uh, and she Smoker's has this, voice. This smoker, exactly. She, she's smoked for a lifetime, and but she has this European sophistication <laughs> yeah. to her that's really great. So she's showing Max a show she's uh, obviously trying to sell him or get onto his station. It's called Apollo and Dionysus. It looks like this kind of overblown 80s type porn yeah. thing. She's excited about it because she thinks this is really something Max will love. Right. But uh, Max is uh, Max is not too in tune to it. It's, no. it's not, not exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, he wants something more contemporary. And uh, he asks her if she's ever heard of Videodrome. He says it's just uh, torture and murder, uh, no plot, no character. It's it's very, very realistic. So he wants her to go find it. This is what I'm looking for. I, I think this is what's next, the next big thing. And Marcia says, then God help us. Yes. <laughs> so Marcia gets back to him. And um, she explains to him that uh, you need to stay away from this video drone. She says it's very dangerous. It's not for public consumption. And it's not acting it's for real. It's real torture and real murder. Snuff TV, she says. But she's she's interesting. Like she does say, "Be careful, Max. It, it has something you don't. It has a philosophy, right? Like, and that's this, what makes it dangerous. This is the real thing." She tells him to go seek out Brian Oblivion because he's the one who would know about it. That's the only name she can get, Brian Oblivion. Right. So he seeks him out. So then we cut to this, I love it, it's it's kind of like a Bowery mission, the cathode ray mission in an old church building, uh-huh. like a lot of them are. Basically, that you, you go into the mission rather than, you know, getting some sort of a sermon or getting hot soup and whatnot, which I guess they, they do serve some food and stuff right. in there. You, you get your daily dose <laughs> of the cathode ray tube. In <laughs> essence, you just sit in front of some television, and that's what Brian Oblivion's philosophy is, that you need to have more television. <laughs> but it's funny when he goes in, because there's all these kind of makeshift cubicles. Well, that's Carol Spear. 
I mean, this really great set yeah. of this retrofitted hodgepodge, you know, garbagey stuff you'd find out in, in, yeah. on a construction site. Because how much would a mission have? How much money would a mission have? So it's whatever they can find. And it's all hammered together, and it's <laughs> it, it's got some graffiti on one thing and some wallpaper on another cubicle. So and and all these different makes of televisions, you know, some really cheap ones, right. black and white. So these little cubicles have these TVs in each cubicle, and there's like a homeless person in there right. in each one. Instead of giving him food, they're sitting there watching TV. And so he goes upstairs looking for Brian, uh, and he comes up to this, gets upstairs, sneaks up there, and there's this gothic office, kind of old furniture and pews and paintings, and 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 he runs into Bianca Oblivion, which is Brian's daughter. Brian's daughter, right? And Max asks, you know, what's this all about? You know, what's what's the story with these people right, right. sitting watching television? And she says that it will. At least in her father's philosophy is it will help them patch into the world's mixing board. So he wants to talk to the father, but she she's like he doesn't talk. He only communicates I on love television. This, on television, right? It's like the monologue is his preferred mode of discourse. I love that. <laughs> and then we cut to Max back in his apartment, and he's writing notes. He's looking at Videodrome again. She has brought him a tape, Bianca Oblivion, and he picks it up. He's looking at it, and suddenly it just, again, this thing starts to breathe. You see it actually flex and take a breath. It's like a chest moving, <sighs> breathing. And he, he, he drops it. Drops it like a hot potato. And, and I just have to say, again, practical effects. This, it looks like a hard something. You yeah, know, it looks like hard plastic, black plastic. And it actually breathes and moves. It's great. Great stuff. So he drops it on the floor, and, he, and he's kind of freaked out about it, and then he just kind of... Taps it with his toe. <laughs> like, is that thing going to bite me? And then he looks around the apartment like like he's waiting for Alan Funt to c- come out of the room or something. <laughs> and he puts it in the player and we see it's, uh, it's Brian Oblivion on TV. And he's going on about... You know, the battle of North America is is being fought in the video arena. The video video drone. And, you know, he goes his whole philosophy again. The, the TV is, screen is the retina of the mind's eye, blah, blah, blah. He's got this whole philosophy how TV's just kind of taken over our lives. And he, and he suddenly starts talking directly to Max from the TV. Brian Oblivion is talking, like you said, about this, his whole philosophy and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden... The perspective changes because the sound changes, and Brian Oblivion looks directly at Max. Yeah. And Max just sits straight up in his chair and starts paying attention to what's going on here. And suddenly, out from behind Brian Oblivion, we see this henchman, dressed as we've seen before. Shackling him. The guy's just one at a time shackling each arm to the chair. Yeah. Uh, And suddenly, he just starts to choke. Brian Oblivion. He's mid-sentence. And and Max is just totally freaked out. Somebody's actually killing this guy. So as he's being choked, he's saying, I was Videodrome's first victim. And then we see the hood come off of the executioner, Uh and the executioner is Nikki Brand. Max doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know how to make heads or tails of any of this stuff. And she's like, come to me, Max. And he's hypnotized. He's like slowly drawn to the TV. And she's she's kind of very sexually enticing him to come. Beckoning. Come to me, yeah. He gets closer and closer to the television set. And as he does, the television set becomes alive. It starts to breathe just like the video cassette. Yeah. And it starts to expand. And then you see veins yeah. pulsating on the top of the television <laughs> <Yes>. set. <laughs> and once again, we're talking Rick Baker Oh, right. my God. Yeah. You totally believe that this thing, this hard piece of wooden plastic and glass has come alive and is yeah. breathing. It reminded me of the, uh, uh, of the haunting. Oh, the house yeah, yeah. is breathing. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, uh, and what's great on the TV is Nikki keeps talking and enticing Max. The camera gets closer and closer to her, and it's just her lips now. Right. Her red lips just filling the screen. And Max gets really all caught up in this. Yeah. And he starts to lean into the television set, and the television screen yeah. starts to bow. It starts to flex out toward him, and it's it's become this living, breathing thing, this television set. 
I, it has to be the weirdest <laughs> lovemaking scene I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Finally, Woods just throws his whole body into it and puts his head into the television screen, yeah. which flexes around him, and he puts his hand on it, and he's making love to Nikki through the television screen. It, like, his head seems to go right into the screen. And you, you're looking at this going, okay, I don't know how they did this. Clearly, it's special effects with some prosthetics or something. or but Some it, sort of rubber stretching out in it, but it looks totally but convincing. But it's glowing like the TV. Yes, it's projecting uh, the, the actual image itself. It's, it's really a great effect. I mean, and, and so unusual. Cronenberg in a nutshell, right? You know, just Absolutely. like technology becoming alive. And again, we just have to say again, this is all before CGI. It's all practical effects. It's bizarre, it's erotic, and it's believable, John. Yeah. And that's the beauty of David Cronenberg and his, you know, his cinematographer and his his art director, Carol Spear. I mean, this is what really makes it all come together. This guy has ideas in his head and they are realized <laughs> on the screen. It's incredible. Yeah. So now we're back at the Cathode Raid mission and Max he has his cassette, and he's showing it to Bianca Oblivion. He's handing it to her, and he goes, watch out. It bites. Yeah. <laughs> and he explains how he's been hallucinating, and, and she tells him that you have to be careful, Max. Videodrome is a signal, basically. And, and, it, and it can be delivered through anything, even as innocuous as a test pattern. Right, yeah. It John, doesn't have to be the video. John, a test pattern, okay? <laughs> We're going way, way back. Before television was 24 hours a day, we actually signed off the television at the National Anthem, yeah. and then we had boop with the test pattern. And she's telling him this signal will induce a brain tumor, and then the tumor will cause hallucinations. So she's basically And you let saying, me watch it, he says? Yeah, he's like, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> but she, did, she didn't realize that- that he was not coming for her. She's expecting for someone to come to her yeah. and, 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 and kill her. But she says, you're just, just another victim yeah. like my father was. Right. So he wants to see the, her father. Like, Where's your father? And he's like, she's like, he's back here. And he cut into this back storage room and it's just lined with shelves and shelves, various types of video cassettes and reels. And all and kinds of grays. They're yeah. all just kinds of grays. I love this scene. What I love about this scene is that all, so all too often you see in a movie where they go, okay, we're going to sit you down for a little while. We're going to explain what's going on here. Yeah. But it's done in a really interesting conversational way. And I think that, that Woods is so good in this scene because you really believe that he's overwhelmed that, wait a second, this is your father all on videotape? Your father, right. your father died? Well, I, I, I appeared on television with him. He's on television. How could he possibly be dead? And she says, I've been keeping him alive right. with the videotapes. Well, he knew he was dying. So he spent days and days and days recording his message. Right. In all different formats. and you know, So he knew he would live on on these tapes. It's almost a metaphor for today, right? He's become TV. He's right. become the media. Well, he said he, he, sell, he, said he felt that being on television yeah. was more real than life itself. But think about that. Isn't that what we're doing today? Like everyone is taking video and photos, going up on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We're living our lives on the air. Right. Now think this, about 1983. Yeah. How far ahead of its time this kind of concept was, absolutely positively. Brian Oblivion was the first. <laughs> <laughs> and we learned that, that Brian Oblivion helped to create Videodrome. And his nefarious business partners wanted to take it away from him. And it ended up in Oblivion's death. I love how Woods plays this whole scene out. You just see it on his face that he's not this smarmy guy at this moment. He's, he's intrigued and incredulous at the same time. Well, now he's worried he's infected. Uh, well, he knows for a fact he's infected. Yeah. So. You know, what do I do now? Basically, he asks her. She basically just hands him a bunch of tapes. The answer is here in all these tapes. So we cut to, to Max's home. He's watching Brian Oblivion on TV. Right. It's night. He's laid out on his couch just sitting there. He's got no shirt on. But he has a gun holster on. <laughs> the holster now, around now the his shoulder. the thing shoulders. is, this is just showing you how paranoid he's really becoming yeah. about this. 
You know what he looked like? Uh, Travis Bickle, basically. Absolutely. He's exactly what he looked like. Yeah, yeah. Like, who sits watching TV with a gun around their, you know, on their shoulder? Well, if you're Travis Bickle, you do sit around home like that. (laughs) So, Brian Oblivion is, he's going on and on about how this tumor was a growth in his head and how it progressed. You know, massive doses of Videodrome will create a new outgrowth of the human brain. He's going on and on about how this is going to become flesh. Yes, a new organ you're going to get. It's not a tumor. It's a new organ that's going to heighten your brain function. And it's scary in a way because it's this whole like allegory of how our perception of reality, you watch too much TV, you know, it's going to infect infect your brain or affect your brain rather. Well, Um, it's like it's like Peter Finch in, in Network. And when he says... He says, it all comes through the tube. <laughs> yeah. But that's exactly what's happening here. Yeah. Now, we don't have the tube anymore. We've we've mechanized it in such a way that we don't need that cathode ray we tube anymore. We have the screen. Now. Right, the screen. <laughs> but it's all the same thing. So no matter how much technology you have, we're still getting drawn further and further into it. And, and that's why Max is in business, because people want more stuff. So suddenly you cut back to Max, and he's watching, and he, he just looks down. For some reason, he just looks down. He's itching his stomach. And he's got this scar. Look like he must have had an operation or something at right. the time. It's just got this vertical scar straight up his abdomen. He, he starts to scratch and scratch, but he's scratching it with his pistol. And then all of a sudden, this wound opens. Large gaping wound. Slit. Vertical slit. Very strange. <laughs> the strangest makeup effect you'll see, I'm sure. Yeah. So... Max is is kind of looking at this thing like, I mean, in a way, he's surprised, but it's, it's there. It's a gaping chasm in the middle of his abdomen. But inexplicably, he just takes the gun, like just w- poking it, yeah. like what, what? And you're looking at this going, there's no way they did this. How did they do this? You cannot see any kind of device or right. He's not hidden. And in he's some sitting way there on the couch without a shirt. Yeah. And it, you don't see his body in a different shape, nope. like they stuck it on or something. It's like, <laughs> no. what the heck? And he's poking it and poking it, and suddenly he starts to put the gun inside his stomach. And in he's this feeling slit. around. Would you do that? First of all, if you had a wound like that, would you stick something in it? No, I don't think so. <laughs> but it reminded me of, there's a, there's a Stephen King story. It's called The, the uh, Revelations of Becca Paulson. It was in Rolling Stone years and years ago. And in it, this woman accidentally shoots herself in the head yeah. with this pistol up on the shelf and <laughs> she starts poking and prodding it. She puts actually puts a, an eyebrow pencil in oh as my far God. as it'll go because she can't believe that this just took place. So that's exactly what this reminded me of. <laughs> so he sticks the gun in and of course he, he tries to pull it out and his, and his hand gets stuck. <laughs> and he plucks his hand out and then the, the wound closes up. Without the gun. He doesn't have Suddenly, gun. he's lost the gun. Yeah. And, and he goes, this can't be possible. It's got to be in the couch or on the floor. But it's funny. He goes looking yeah, all over Under for the it, cushions, right? throwing stuff out. You hear glasses breaking and stuff. He, he can't believe that it, I lost the gun. It's inside me. It, it's like when you and I lose our eyeglasses. <laughs> <laughs> where did I put those? <laughs> I never checked my stomach. No, you I've know, never maybe, done maybe, that. Maybe that's where it is. <laughs> So, so after this horrific experience, and once again, this is Cronenberg. You are carried through this this fantastical story. You, it's not even possible, but you believe it. Oh, yeah. Because you're seeing it on the screen. <laughs> so he gets his phone call from somebody he doesn't even know, and he says that Barry Convex wants to talk to you. Yes. There's a car waiting for you downstairs. What I also love about Cronenberg is he, he has a sort of Dickensian way with names, you know, Barry Convex. Yeah. This yeah. guy this guy's the head of spectacular optical, you know, <laughs> which makes lenses right. for for glasses for third world countries, and they also make uh missile systems for uh for NATO. So it's some kind of huge conglomerate we Exactly. Right. But what's funny is when he gets to the location, it's this dumpy eyeglass store. Yeah. In this poor neighborhood, as you said, they're making glasses. I I just thought that was kind of funny. It is weird because it's, you know, the glass is cracked on the the door when they come in and stuff. So (laughs) it isn't a crappy little neighborhood and it's a, you know, crappy little store. I actually think it's that way because that's what the budget (laughs) 
And they said, well, let's use it. There you go. <laughs> um, make the most of it. So Barry Convex introduces himself to Max and has him come in, in, into the back of the shop. And uh, he says, look, a, he's concerned because the video drone signal has gotten out there. And we know that Max has gotten infected by it. Right. And he's concerned because he doesn't want to spread any further. Our other people that have been exposed to the Videodrome signals, they're in need of intense psychiatric care. So I advise you to just work with me on this. We want to tape your hallucinations and then study them. Well, he, he's got this bizarre, he calls it a prototype contraption. And he, say, he well, he entices Max by saying, you know, it may help him with the tumor if you let us record your, your visions, basically. They want to analyze it and see, and see exactly what's going on there. And, and the way to induce it, it which is interesting, <laughs> yes. is we, we need a little S&M to get the, um, the juices flowing. Well, something about S&M and violence. It's the violence and the sex that hits your receptors in your brain yeah. that opens you up to receive the, the video. Videodrome signal. What's great is you're back in this, this kind of dank back room now, and here's this huge kind of headset. It goes over your head. And you can see there's glasses in it. It's, again, it's like 30 years before virtual reality glasses. It looks just like a virtual reality helmet. Yeah. Barry Convex is trying to come across that he's trying to help Max. Right. But Barry Convex isn't really interested in helping Max. He's interested in using him to further his whole Videodrome project. And we find out that Harlan, his faithful assistant, is a plant. That he right. had been planted there two years to kind of prime this whole thing so they could get their hands on Channel 83. And it, this is a very interesting tale when Max realizes Harlan has never looked at the screen. Right. That's why. That's <laughs> why you didn't get it. You never looked at the screen. <laughs> he turns away. And this was knew. never broadcast. Yes. This is all on tape to infect Max with the video drone signal. And Harlan further explains why they want to get this Videodrome signal into the households of the American public. He but says, he's also, before you say go, that, go. he's blaming Max for kind of distributing this crap to the nation, right. in a way. He calls it a cesspool uh, of a right. station. So he, yeah. says, he says, North America is getting soft and the rest of the world is getting tough, very, very tough. And we're entering savage new times. We got to be pure. And, and we got to be direct and we got to be strong if we're going to survive this. So it's so Barry, so Barry says, you know what? We think you're ready for something new. And he pulls out this video cassette. Yeah. And he jams it into Max's abdomen, that open scar. Well, what's funny is he's approaching Max. You see this kind of wind yeah. blow Max and we're kind of in this another reality. Right. And suddenly Max's shirt is open and there's the wound again. And Barry Convex <laughs> shoves the video cassette into it like you sort of would vertically into a VCR. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now he's quote unquote reprogramming Max right. to take him to another level. So Max is kind of Crawling around on the floor uh, in pain and, and uh, you know, Barry... Why, why make him watch something if you can insert the videotape right into him? Just cut, <laughs> cut out the middleman, right? He's going to play him. That's right. <laughs> but he, he says, we want Channel 83, Max. Uh, kill your partners and give, give us, us Channel, Channel 83. 83. Absolutely. So he's going to turn out... He, they want him to be this kind of assassin. So Max reaches into his abdominal slot... And he takes out the pistol that he lost, quote unquote. Suddenly finds it there. Yeah. Amongst and the cassettes. A pair of reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and another magical Rick Baker effect is when he takes the gun out of his abdomen, and then you see the gun start to become part of his hand. Well, these kind of steel tendrils yes. come out of the gun with they're kind of spiked. And they're going through Max's hand. And into it, which obviously it hurts because it's bleeding at the same time. But he's becoming this sort of cyborg type yeah. marriage between machine and flesh. And Max is fascinated at it. He's just looking at it. And again, 
really nice combination of it's almost like claymation and prosthetic makeup. Stop motion. Weird. Yeah. Very good look, but great stuff. So Max now has become the gun, and he goes into the station. Goes into the boardroom where his two partners are, and he kills them. But they see him, and this is really messed up, because when he cuts into the room, the gun is just a regular gun now. Right. And these guys see him, and they put their hands up, like defensively. Right. They know it's coming. They're like, it's not like a- He shoots right through his arm. Yeah. It's awful. I mean, it's not really much- much You feel really bad for these guys. So he kills them both. Have you seen their programming? (laughs) (laughs) I'll just comment on that in a way. Again, this is another thing like that's so common now, like workplace shootings. Yeah. It's weird how this movie is just like way ahead of its time. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things in this movie that have come to fruition. Yeah. Very strange. So a visionary, if if there ever was one, (laughs) Dan Cronenberg. So he he kills his two partners and then, then leaves the building. And then we hear in a voiceover, because I guess this is the program that Max has been programmed, kill Bianca Oblivion. When he gets there, she's prepared for him. She's going to reprogram him like a video tape recorder. And so she sends him out to finish off Videodrome in essence. It's interesting. She's going to change the program. Yeah. It's always painful to remove the cassette. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like she wants him to use what he's learning. She wanted to turn it back on Videodrome. Right. She, so now they're going after Videodrome. Right. Death to Videodrome. Long live the new flesh. Max makes his way to... Spectacular Optical. And he goes in the back, and there's Harlan. There's Harlan. And Harlan's ready for him. And yeah. he goes, okay, I got an idea. And he pulls out a cassette. Now, this one doesn't look even remotely black or plastic. It's it's this flesh-colored, <laughs> pulsating a video cassette that he's ready to just to slam right into Max and reprogram him again. Right. But... He doesn't get what he's bargained for. His <laughs> hand goes into Max's slot in his abdomen with this fleshy video cassette, and all of a sudden, Max looks at him and clenches his abdo- abdominal <laughs> muscles, and Harlan can't Clamps get his hand down out. down on Harlan's hand. And he can't get it out, so he finally rips his hand out of Max's abdomen, and you see his hand is this big... Well, it's almost stripped away. It's stripped away, but what it's become is one of those old-fashioned German hand grenades. Potato mashes, they Potato call Potato mashes, exactly. But in flesh. In flesh, which means his hand is all burned and all ripped away. So, I mean, it, it's painful to look at for But God's it's almost sake. like the handle of it is the bone of his arm. Yes, it's absolutely. It's weird. It's That's just it. like, ugh. Um, and he just is horrified and in pain and he, and he runs backwards and you, you know what happens to the uh, potato masher hand grenades after they go off right John <laughs> it just blows Ba-boom. up and of course I looked at that and I laughed because I thought I think they just threw this in there because they the the guy exploding in scanners yeah. was so popular yeah that they had to do it again. They had to repeat it. They need, they needed to give the audience something. Another showstopper. Yeah. So Max makes his way to Barry Convex, who's in the middle of this big trade show. And then Max comes up on stage with, with the gun. With, I, I love this, the flesh gun. Yes. Because the gun is all covered in ooze also now. It's become part of him more so. It's become completely part of him. You don't yeah. even see the mechanical parts. It's yeah. this, His hand has become this flesh gun. And he stalks and then shoots him several times. And then, then I'm not quite sure it was in those bullets, but boy, oh boy, did Barry Convex... Uh, <laughs> you know, explode, decompose. What would you call that? Uh, well, he shoots convulse. him in the forehead, but then he starts convulsing and stuff just starts oozing out of him. It looks like cauliflower or something. It's just so disgusting. <laughs> it's, re- it's repulsive, yeah. But it's a great effect because the guy's like, <laughs> I couldn't even tell if it was a fake body or really him. It, it was very convincing. It's really 80s. Yeah. It's very 80s, you know, gore effect. Great stuff. Um <laughs> It's almost like David Cronenberg's going, you want gore? You want? I'll give you gore. I'll give you Here's gore. gore. Give you all the gore you want. <laughs> well, they didn't call him the, uh, the, the, the Baron of Blood for nothing. <laughs> so Max makes his way over to uh, this waterfront and, and this abandoned cargo ship. There's like a little mattress in the corner. It's almost like a homeless person is living there. Right. And he's just trying to get away or something and hide. And he just slays down, and and then he sees that console. Then he sees the console with Nikki on it. She says to him, Max, death is not the end. 
in order to become part of the new flesh, as right. he was talking about, you first have to kill the old flesh. But don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to let your body die, which is interesting because it's exactly what Bianca Oblivion said about her father. My father wasn't afraid to let his body die. And she's like, watch, I'll show you how. It's easy. And on the screen, you suddenly cut to Max standing over this fire in the middle of this room, right. but it's on the screen. Right. And he takes the gun, puts it up to his head, and shoots himself. And then, of course, with... With Rick Baker's effect, we see what happens to the television set, which is <laughs> this this <coughs> viscera comes flying out yeah. of the screen and and goes landing all over the place with smoke and whatnot. And he gets up and he and he puts puts up the, the flesh gun to his head and says, "Long live the new flesh!" Bang, and we go to black. I, I found that really interesting. I thought about that. Like, why do you think he showed it twice? I couldn't figure that out exactly. Once on screen, and then you almost see the same exact thing happen, it's but same, it does it, cut away. It is the same. Yeah, right. Well, that maybe way. it starts as the image itself, and right. then it becomes the reality. Maybe. I think maybe so what, what, he's, what, he's, what he's doing in that case. And I have to say, it's, it's just a, <laughs> one of his bleakest endings. Absolutely. Because it's the main character. But is it bleak? Is he actually going on to the new flesh? Is this a re- a rebirth. I think you're and, right. And what kind of what kind of a frightening world are we going to be in for with this, you know, this battle of the new flesh and the old flesh? Well, we have that battle now, right? Because that's it's almost like that's what Republicans this and about. Democrats. <laughs> no, but it's like weird. Like I think a lot of young people and older people are confused about where their lives are. Is yeah. it on a screen or is it? You know what I mean? People get so caught up in screens, they're not living their life. Great example of Cronenberg. If you are interested in a filmmaker who is completely and utterly uncompromising in his vision, this is a movie to see or study some Cronenberg because he bears watching. Amen. Well, that's all the time we have this week. We'd like to thank our friend Glenn Ornowitz for his music. And of course, our listeners for tuning in. So join us next week for another episode of Film Detour. If you like our show, please recommend us to your friends. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play, and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetourpodcast.com to leave comments or email us with questions. You can also visit us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 